Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, so this panel is the panel of the legal experts who've dealt with some of these issues and, and the complexities of uh, antitrust law when it comes to digital platforms. Um, I'd like to introduce everyone. Next to me is Scott Schur. Scott is a partner in Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati's Washington, D.C. office, where his practice focuses on antitrust counseling and litigation. Prior to joining the firm, Scott clerked for both Judge Sneed III of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, hmm, it says both. In San Francisco. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Forget the both. Okay. And um, next to Scott is Logan Breed. Logan is a partner at Hogan, at Hogan Lovells, and he handles many cutting-edge antitrust reviews of mergers and acquisitions uh, since 2002. Uh, Logan's broad industry experience includes computer software and hardware, e-commerce, telecommunications, media and entertainment, consumer products, and defense. And last we have Andy Gavel. Andy is a professor at, at Howard since 1989, and he teaches courses on antitrust law, federal regulations, civil procedure, and complex litigation. Particular areas of interest include the role of the U.S. Supreme Court in formulating antitrust rules. Professor Gavel, Professor Gavel previously served as the director of the Office of Policy Planning at the FTC. So since we have um, the legal expert, experts of the day here, I wanted to start off by talking about the, the fact that there's been these increasing calls for antitrust enforcement um, of digital platforms and their growing dominance. And uh, you know, what are the challenges in applying antitrust law to digital platforms, given one, the fact that they're uh, fast-moving industries, and two, the fact that kind of their dominance is is unusual. It's kind of not similar to to many industries that we've seen in the past. So, do you guys have um, views, Logan? Would you like to start off and what role antitrust can play, and what are the challenges in applying antitrust to digital platforms? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think the bottom line is that antitrust law is still relevant to dynamic digital platform markets, but uh, the application of antitrust law may, might need to look a little different to take into account the unique features of those markets. So, um, for example, these are markets that are very dynamic. They're often focused on innovation competition rather than price competition. Uh, one consequence of that is it can be difficult sometimes to define a relevant market under the antitrust laws. Usually the way we approach that is we'll uh, apply what's called a SNP test. Um, you apply a small but significant non-transitory increase in price to a product set, and if people would pay that increase in price, well, then you've defined your market. If they would switch to something else, then that something else is in the market. Well, how do you do that when the price of a product to a user is zero? Um, it doesn't quite always make sense. Um, so there, there are certain features of these markets that make the, the, the rote application of traditional antitrust law principles somewhat um, uh, incongruous in some cases. Andy, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And the only thing I would add is that um, this traditional way we have of approaching monopolization cases, of defining a market and, and assessing market power in a market, um, it's unclear with some digital platforms, we're using that phrase rather loosely, um, uh, what the market really is. Um, uh, and, and the market itself can be in flux. Um, when we think about um, large platforms, are, are they about big data? Is that really the market that they are in? Are they in the market for selling goods and services? Um, uh, what is Google? What is Amazon? These things are, are not um, good fits for very rigid traditional thinking about antitrust. Um, I think that antitrust still works. I, I completely uh, agree with Logan that it still applies. Um, I still think that it applies well, um, uh, but it does take some thought about the particular characteristics of these markets. Um, and maybe it takes going beyond our you know, rigid traditional approach of I must define a market. Instead, you need to sort of ask the, the, 
the more first principles question of what conduct am I looking at and how is it anti-competitive and how is it pro-competitive? Um, and that really is the way antitrust lawyers, I think, um, approach things today. When you go to court in an enforcement action, you have to deal with the case law. Um, but I think the first question anyone would be asking a client uh, or the government would be asking is, you know, let me understand what particular conduct I'm looking at in this particular market. How could it be anti-competitive, and what might be some justifications? For yeah. It? What's the real competitive effect of this? What is conduct? the yes? Yeah. And, and I think think to that end, what one unique characteristic of these markets is that they're either two-sided or multi-sided often. And the question is how you to measure harm versus benefit. So take Apple for example, which is a multi-sided platform. You're not the only customer who, you know, just because you purchase the iPhone, you're not the only person in the consumer set. There are app developers who make apps. There are also advertisers who advertise on the platform. And I think one question that's really difficult to ask is if a particular policy harms one of those sets of customers but benefits, let's say, the other two, is that anti-competitive? Are you allowed to measure the benefits to one set of customers and balance that against the harm to another set of customers? I don't think that there's really a clear answer in the law as to how you analyze those things, but it's, it's certainly one of the most important issues facing multi-sided multi platforms. So I wonder, Scott, on that point, I wonder if really the problem is looking at harm to customers instead of harm to competition. I mean, if you see that competition is being harmed on one side of the market, isn't that in itself enough to do enforcement, antitrust enforcement? It, it, it depends. I mean, well, first it depends whether or not that harm is being caused by something that's anti-competitive or not. Competition could be harmed by something that, you know, someone could be pro-competitive and innovating faster and that hurts all the competitors in, uh, on one side of the market. So that's one thing that you have to take into account. Uh, the other thing to take into account is, again, I think and Andy summarized it right, is, you know, who are the consumers and what is the harm that you're trying to prevent? Uh, because until you get that first principle correct, you don't know who you're supposed to be looking at and who you're ignoring and determining whether or not there's any injury to the market. I, I do worry, though, about um, this idea that with platforms, because there are sort of multiple inputs, multiple outputs, that somehow we have to figure out a way to do an ultimate reckoning. Um, uh, there has been, you know, an issue that has existed in, in antitrust law for a long time between aggregate welfare and consumer welfare. Um, consumer welfare focusing on the impact of the particular conduct that's anti-competitive. Um, uh, I don't know that we really want to venture into some kind of aggregate um, reckoning. Um, that would be a different approach than what we've done before. Um, uh, it is not new. It, this is a different form of it. Um, but the, the, the notion going back to merger analysis of whether we're going to weigh uh, benefits to the producer and uh, against harm to the consumer, we have generally rejected that. And we've said, no, we're going to focus on harm to the consumer. Um, but um, uh, as Scott says, in, in these cases, we have to sort of define who, who is the, where is the harm, who is the targeted group of you know, consumers, buyers who would be harmed by this reduction of competition. Um, and I think once we do that, we have to focus on whether or not um, there's any benefits that will flow to them as opposed to benefits that will flow to somebody else. I don't, I don't know that we can do this sort of balancing of different sectors of the economy. And the only thing I'd add to that is it, it really becomes a question of who's a consumer. Uh, you know, I mean, a consumer could be an end user of a product, but mm -hmm. it, a consumer could also be uh, an advertising, an, an advertiser, right? A yeah. consumer could also be an app developer. And I do think that it's important when you're determining whether or not a policy is pro-competitive or anti-competitive that you look at all of the potential consumers. I agree with you on the issue of producer versus consumer welfare, but I do think that one of the interesting questions in platform markets is what is a consumer? Mm -hmm. well, and, and beyond that, there could be some subset of consumers uh, even on one side of the platform that are harmed by some conduct, but another subset would be you know, better off as a result of that conduct. So there can be um, exclusionary um, uh, practices that, uh, that arguably enhance the value of the platform to some consumers, um, while at the same time disadvantaging other consumers who, for example, don't want to have an integrated ecosystem but want to use different elements of, of various competitors' products in, in, instead of that unified ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think the way that would play out, though, um, within the context of a consumer welfare model is that would be part of the defense of the conduct. Right. The, the argument for the, the conduct would be, um, look, we have business justifications. Here they are. 
Um, uh, we're not really uh, engaging in this conduct for the purpose of benefiting ourselves in an anti-competitive way. Um, so I think that's the, the likeliest way it would play yeah. out. I do think um, there's starting to be some pushback on the whole focus on consumer welfare and particularly the way consumer welfare has been defined. I and mean, we saw that at our, our first day of this conference yesterday, um, that kind of this single-minded focus on prices and that low prices to consumers means that concentration and bigness are fine. You know, as long as you get something cheap at Walmart, it's okay that there's no longer small retailers and all the Walmart's employees are paid for by all, all our taxes. Um, so, you know, there's definitely pushback in terms of focusing on only price as the measure of consumer welfare. So, you know, looking at other things like quality, choice, diversity, um, innovation, and I wonder if you're, this idea of aggregate welfare and looking at producers, is that also you know, expanding what it means, what consumer welfare means, or is that an entirely different shift where you're looking not just at the, you're looking at the producers, the consumers, are you also looking at those qualitative considerations? Um, I'd break that down into two parts. Certainly within the consumer welfare model, uh, we could be looking at prices, quality, innovation, service. All of those things could be anti-competitive consequences of conduct. Um, uh, but we would be looking at it in the context of how it affects consumers. Um, the aggregate welfare issue, I think, is a legitimate question, but maybe not for antitrust. It's a broader public policy question. Um, and I, I looked at some of the material from yesterday, and I think the answer ultimately becomes, well, if, if you don't like the wages that result from a system, um, is antitrust the solution? I think uh, I'm guessing the three of us would all agree no, that antitrust is not a very good tool for that. Um, but maybe you want some other public policy tools that, that address that. Um, competition policy is a far broader concept than antitrust law enforcement. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. So another example could be um, uh, if financial institutions become too big to fail, antitrust might not be the way to fix that problem because often um, the status of those entities was not the product of mergers, which were subject to Section 7 review, or even if they were, those mergers didn't um, uh, meet the test that we have under Section 7 for an anti-competitive transaction. and and. You know, at the end of the day, maybe some other form of, of public policy intervention is more appropriate or is a better, a better, more finely tuned tool than antitrust law to fix those problems. I, I was just going to say, and I, I think one, one great example of looking at why antitrust is such a poor tool is to, is to what the European Commission is doing with platforms like Google. Uh, I think that's being much more motivated by the fact that uh, politicians in Europe in particular are unhappy that, you know, as I think Alden was talking about earlier, that there aren't sufficient number of European companies who are innovators in the tech space. And I think the European Commission is trying to shoehorn the, uh, the, the fixing of that problem by trying to put it into some sort of an antitrust box, and it just doesn't fit. And what you're going to end up with, as Alden noted, is a whole bunch of less efficient, potentially less efficient competitors being protected at the expense of consumer welfare at the end of the day. So I definitely want to talk about the EU, but I want to touch back on one thing that you, both of you guys just said about antitrust enforcement being a poor tool. And I just want to push back a little bit and say, isn't that just looking at the standards for Section 7 enforcement that have evolved like since, you know, the 80s, since... Uh, antitrust has become, you know, heavily influenced by, you know, Bork and e making it all about low prices and e economic Chicago efficiency. School. Yeah, yeah, Chicago School. And uh, if you actually look at the roots of antitrust, it was about concerns about bigness and power. And don't we, we could have those tools if we made a choice to have those tools under the antitrust laws. I'd love to hear Andy's answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too little to flail. <laughs> um, I think that this narrative that there was before Chicago and then Chicago um, is too simplistic a narrative. I think if we look back at some of the antitrust decisions of the Supreme Court in the 1960s, um, it would be hard to find anyone, really, who would defend those decisions. Um, uh, uh, opposition to mergers that resulted in firms of single digits, when it was quite clear that th those resulted in inefficiencies. Um, and Chicago is not the only school of thought that um, caused antitrust to change over the last 35 or 40 years. 
Having said that, I do think we've gotten to the point where antitrust has, has been boxed in um, in a very narrow way. Um, and there are a variety of ways that you can look at. Um, just look on the litigation side. My other field is procedures. So just, just look at what the course of an antitrust litigation looks like today because of changes in law. Um, burden of pleading has been elevated by Twombly. Um, the burden of getting a class action certified has been greatly elevated. The burden of getting expert witnesses admitted has been greatly elevated. Summary judgment because of Matsushita has been um, uh, much more empowered and encouraged. So when, and those, those are just some examples, it keeps going. When the burden of proof has been raised, the rule of reason is much more flexible, but it's also much more demanding, both for public and private plaintiffs. So when you look at the collective impact of that, um, uh, what you see is a, a formidable path ahead if you want to bring an antitrust case. Um, uh, and we could go in, and maybe we will, to some specific areas where perhaps it has gotten a little bit too constrained. Um, one area I think has gotten very constrained is proving conspiracy and agreement. It's gotten very difficult. Supreme Court just agreed to hear another case. It will be interesting um, to see where they come out in that. Um, but I think what that means is um, uh, that if you're the government or a, a private party thinking of bringing a case, um, uh, given the resources, given the timeline of how long it takes to fully litigate a case, um, there is going to be reluctance to do it. You see it in the numbers. Um, right now, is just looking at this recently, um, the number of new civil antitrust cases being brought in the federal courts uh, in the last five years has averaged between six and 800 out of a total civil federal docket of almost 300,000 cases. If you look back at the 1970s with a much smaller docket, twice that number was being brought in terms of antitrust cases. So the, the big fear of antitrust enforcement uh, that, that is often um, expressed by some, um, some conservatives, um, is, is greatly exaggerated. Um, uh, the market, in a sense, has responded to how difficult antitrust is as a, as a field uh, and the reduced number, and many of those are follow-ons to government cases. Um, so antitrust enforcement is a very, very limited tool these days. And uh, we definitely spoke about that yesterday as well, and I guess the question is always, do you just stick with the bad case law forever, or do you find, try to find some good cases to bring and challenge that case law? And, and basically, you're never going to be able to change the case law unless you bring cases? That's right. That's right. And I think the, the notion of the carefully crafted test case has become very important. Um, use of amicus briefs. Um, uh, in select uh, private cases is very important. Um, and interestingly enough, the last time we saw both of those really being done aggressively um, uh, was during the period that critics look back and say, oh, there was conservative enforcement. Um, if you look at the development of what we call the quick look under the rule of reason, from beginning to end, that was actually a Republican-inspired uh, effort to make easy cases easier to bring. Um, <laughs> Cases like Polygram, um, uh, North Texas Physicians, um, those, those derive from earlier cases. NCAA was influenced by a brief um, filed by Doug Ginsburg when he was at the Antitrust Division. Um, so we have areas where those careful test cases have proven to be important. Um, uh, the FTC's McWain case recently, it, it led to some um, uh, difference of opinion within the FTC, but that's a very important case. I mean, it's one of these maybe little cases. It's not a Microsoft case, but it sets some really important parameters and precedents for exclusive dealing. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that one challenge for this and future administrations will be to carefully craft some good test cases to push the envelope. If, in a sense, if you're not losing once in a while as the government, you're not really testing anything. And, and what I would say is I actually think that this FTC and DOJ have been pushing the envelope in areas where they have not pushed the envelope before. So you look in merger policy, you know, I, I, I know that Senator Warren yesterday was saying that, you know, the industries have gotten too concentrated, and perhaps that's correct. But you look at the, the airline complaint, which ultimately was settled, uh, but that was the first time that the DOJ had ever argued that there's a national market for airlines. 
that's pushing the envelope. Comcast, Time Warner, they would look at the broadband market rather than just how you normally look at cable deals, which is to look at uh, overlaps in users. It's very narrow geographic. Markets, right, yeah. right. Um, you have the American Express case, which was uh, certainly uh, pushing the envelope type of case for DOJ. The pay for delay cases at the FTC, and then recently the decision of the FTC to bring a whole bunch of hospital cases. Those are all pushing the envelope, I think. So there definitely is an, an interest, I think, at both of the agencies to push the envelope, at least now, where they think they can make a difference in the law. So I want to go back to um, Scott. Scott brought up the EU enforcement against Google, and I, I want to start talking about that. Um, particularly, I'm interested in, in your views on why, I think I have a little idea. I, I've got a preview of what Scott's going to say. but. Um, why do you think it happened in the EU, and do you think it could happen here? Um, and also the likelihood of follow-on enforcement actions from other enforcers around the globe. So, so uh, you know, I obviously preview that I, I do think that the case against Google in Europe is political and policy motivated by the fact that Europeans are you know, lagging fairly far behind in, in technology, and that's why, and there are, the other big problem in Europe, in my opinion, and full disclosure, I represent Google, if you couldn't tell, but the other big problem is that they tend to listen to competitors more often than other, other uh, well, particularly the U.S., and they take the views of competitors very seriously. Um, you, your second question was whether or not that can help and el happen elsewhere, and the answer is a resounding yes. I mean, I think the enforcement actions in, in, uh, that are pending in Europe right now have resulted in investigations against Google in, in a, a multitude of jurisdictions, and uh, unfortunately, it seems like the influence of, uh, you know, uh, car carpetbagging uh, complainers going around the world and, and explaining to agencies why, why Google is so bad seems to be resonating with a number of competition authorities around the world. You know, you just look at the decision that came out of India, for example, is just one example against Google. But uh, so, yes, um, uh, I do think that it can result and has resulted in multiple jurisdictions bringing cases. And I'll say, in addition to whatever political dimension exists, there also is arguably a somewhat different substantive legal standard that's applied. And, and in Europe, the test is whether there's been an abuse of a dominant position, whereas in the U.S., under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, uh, a plaintiff would need to prove both market power and exclusionary conduct. And that, that's a pretty high bar, actually. Um, uh, my favorite example is a case that we handled back in 2007 um, defending MySpace in a monopolization case brought by a, a competitor called uh, Live Universe. Uh, that was complaining that MySpace was the dominant social network and was a huge giant that no one else was ever going to be able to defeat and was engaged in exclusionary conduct by refusing to let other sites um, link to MySpace. So uh, Live Universe wanted to start its own competing social network and argued that because MySpace wouldn't let people link from their MySpace page to this Live Universe page, that um, that was uh, exclusionary conduct in violation of Section 2. Um, uh, we won, actually, on a motion to dismiss uh, on the exclusionary conduct point, and then uh, that was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit. Um, was but, MySpace still around? But, but the funny part <laughs> is, I mean, if you take a step back, a year or two later, this little website called Facebook ended up completely destroying MySpace, and so whatever market power MySpace had at the time was completely ethereal, right? And so um, at the end of the day, it was obviously um, not a valid Section 2 case, but um, in the short run, the, the, even if the market power was assumed, the exclusionary conduct wasn't there. And, and that is something, I think, that is easier to, to, to prove in the European Union than it is in the U.S. I would just add um, a couple of points. First, I, I think it is important to realize that our monopolization standards uh, are the most permissive in the world. Yeah. Um, uh, they really are quite permissive. Um, it's very hard to prove monopolization. Our idea that you're not a monopoly until you have over, you know, close to three quarters of the market uh, is really viewed in the rest of the world as extraordinarily permissive uh, to the point of being foolish. So it is important to understand it's not Europe that's the outlier. In a sense, it's the United States standards that, the, that are the outlier. Um, the European model is far more common in the rest of the world, this notion of abusive dominance. Um, second point I'd make is I, I guess I would describe myself as a political narrative skeptic. Um, I hear the political narrative, and I think in Europe, um, uh, you, uh, Europeans would look at the U.S. If we are criticizing, they would say we're the ones who are engaging in the political narrative, just trying to protect 
U large U.S. companies. And that happened during the Microsoft years. Um, our government was very uh, vocal in criticizing the Europeans and the Koreans, for example, in continuing their cases against Microsoft. And the criticism of us was we were just trying to protect um, U.S. companies. I think ultimately, Ama, 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 ama,
Microsoft case or is that there are certain um, key elements to a good case, okay? Um, the market characteristics, I think as Scott said, there were some pretty, and uh, maybe Logan said, there are some pretty unique market characteristics in Microsoft. 
Um, network effects were important and developed there. The applications barrier to entry, switching costs being very high. Um, we've, we, we've sort of focused, the discussion now focuses on the mobile platform, um, but the truth is um, uh, most of us are still using Windows. Um, uh, the Windows monopoly. 95% share for desktop. It's actually higher than it was, and Office is, has quietly sort of you know, stayed in the background. So Microsoft still makes enormous profits from Windows uh, and is still a very, very durable monopoly, and that didn't change as a result of the case. So market characteristics are one. Second is conduct. Exclusive dealing is a kind of conduct that can be anti-competitive. Um, but in Microsoft, and I guess I, I disagree a little bit with Scott that there were no technological issues, formally the tying claim was reversed. But there were a lot of design issues that were challenged successfully as being anti-competitive because they had not only no business justification, but they had no technical justification. The way uh, Internet Explorer was embedded and made unremovable was a real problem. Um, so you have market characteristics and conduct, but then you have to think about the evidence. And one of the things that we have a problem with as outside commentators whether it's an Amazon or a Google case, is we don't really know what the, the internal documents look like. And in Microsoft, they were bad. I mean, there was a lot of bad documents. In, in, Mc, in McWain, there were some really bad documents that said, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And it turned out that those documents were consistent with a very anti-competitive story. They were not consistent with any efficiency story. Um, and the final thing I would say, and this certainly was a, a lesson of both the European and the U.S. Microsoft cases, is you have to think about remedy yeah. um, and what it is that you're trying to do. Fines are sort of a, a crude remedy to deter, but it is damn hard to deter some of these really large successful companies with fines. Um, I, I wrote this book about the Microsoft case. We tried to calculate at the end of the day how much currency, how much hard money Microsoft actually paid in fines and settlements and, you know, the, the, the disruption in the company. The biggest number you could maybe come up with was eight or nine billion dollars, which sounds like a lot, uh, until you realize that the annual profits on Windows is about 18 billion with a 92 percent return rate. So 10 years of litigation, Sadly, if you had to, you know, counsel Microsoft, you say, ah, do it again. <laughs> absolutely, business, absolutely yeah. worth it, cost of doing business. So whether or not Amazon or Google fit these characteristics, and maybe it tells you how hard it is to bring a good solid case, um, you do have to consider those market characteristics, the conduct, the evidence, the remedy, and any justifications. And that tells you why these cases are not so easy to bring. I'd like to open up for any questions from the audience. Does anyone in the audience have a question? Or do you have a, oh, so, oh, oh, wait. We had a, I, I asked this question on the last panel. Um, so if the EU brings actions against, uh, cases against Google, and uh, is, brings cases on search, uh, Android, and, um, and advertising, and it turns out that there is uh, more competition and vertical search providers like Yelp and other uh, smaller companies have success there. Um, what does that do to um, the U.S. position, which is that th there's no problem here with Google? Right? Well, I, again, maybe I can make a, uh, give a partial answer to that. Um, I think it's very short-sighted when you're looking at these kinds of dynamic uh, innovation-based technology platform markets to focus on uh, a snapshot of temporal competition. So um, the, the, the way that innovation competition works in these industries typically is, uh, is, is on a leapfrog basis. So instead of having more people doing the exact same thing that Google's doing in those areas today, Consumers will be best off if someone else creates an entirely new technology, an entirely new way of thinking about solving a given problem um, that obviates the need for there to be a lot of people doing exactly what Google is doing. So I think the, the premise of the question is based on sort of an old economy way of looking at competition and, and is static rather than dynamic. And, and I would say, I mean, if, if, if there's no violation and the European Commission nonetheless imposes a remedy in an effort to jumpstart competition, you're not going to end up with better competition. You're going to end up with a whole bunch of less efficient competitors and customers having worse choices as a result of some 
regulatory overlay. You're not letting the market decide what the right outcome is. You're letting a regulator decide what the right outcome is. And the result of that, if the market really demands that you know, Yelp step up his game to compete rather than rely on the European Commission to compete, then customers in Europe are going to be worse off and Yelp will succeed, succeed. It'll do better in Europe, but customers in Europe will be worse off than customers elsewhere around the world. There's, yeah. There's a question up in the front. Yeah. Oh, in front of the podium here, yeah. How do you reconcile the fact that um, these dominant or so-called dominant companies don't behave like classic dominant companies? Uh, they're, they're not getting lazy, their costs aren't increasing, they're not increasing prices. Innovation sim still seems to be at a pretty high pace. I mean, uh, a lot's been said about how durable they are, but they don't act like they're, uh, they feel safe, you know? It, if you were to draw an analogy, it's uh, if, you tell swimmers there's sharks in the water, they're gonna behave differently, even though shark attacks are rare. So it just seems to me that, you know, that it's hard to show consumer harm when, you know, Amazon is increasing, it's 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 increasing 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 it's increasing, 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 it's increasing. The way that antitrust law can remain relevant in, in analyzing these dynamic platform uh, competition um, industries is by, in both the unilateral conduct, you know, monopolization and the merger side, trying to find conduct that impedes disruptive innovation. And um, and Microsoft is a good example of that, where the, the it, um, very, very intentionally disrupted the ability of Java to enable a, a leapfrog technology to bypass the operating system entirely. Looking for those kinds of examples of, of exclusionary conduct that impedes disruptive innovation is, I think, the key to finding a good balance between um, antitrust enforcement that is going to help consumers and um, avoiding over enforcement. And, and I, just just one f uh, follow up to to the yes comment. I really do think it comes down to what your philosophy is with regard to enforcement. Are you more concerned about false negatives or false positives? And I, I and and are you concerned about over enforcement or under enforcement? And I think the one special thing about technology is it should not always obviously be hands off and the antitrust laws don't apply. I think that that's a, obviously a silly argument, 
But I think that where you have markets that are changing really rapidly, I think the agencies have to be very careful that they're not over-enforcing, because over-enforcing can have the same effect as under-enforcement or worse, because it, deter, it could deter innovation, and it could deter somebody from taking the next step to try to improve its product, because it's concerned about what an agency might consider the impact of that improvement to be on a competitor uh, or, or on a group of competitors who might not be as efficient. And I think the flip side of that is under-enforcement could inhibit innovative startups and disrupt, you know, potential disruptive technologies. Striking the balance between those things is difficult. But um, I think we get a little bit um, overemphasized on the false positive side. We focus on the uh, innovation incentives of the dominant firms. Um, we, we also have to care about the innovation incentives of those who would challenge the dominant firms and make sure that those, those incentives are healthy and are not being um, uh, unreasonably impaired by conduct of the dominant firms. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank our panelists for this great discussion today. And Hi, everybody, for listening to us. Thank you. <laughs>